Once again, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, training webinar. Let's uh, have a quick look at the agenda. So what we're going to essentially do is look at uh, the process of uh, user creation, um, including all the additional things you need to do when you are creating a new user, such as uh, assigning licenses and setting the user defaults, making sure they've got the right add-ons, um, getting their form settings correct, um, and uh, you know, so on. There's a few things there. Um, and then you may also need to set up things like approval processes and assign those and, and set up alerts to the users. Um, finally, we're going to look at just uh, user login history and uh, how to uh, disconnect uh, or how to see who's currently logged in and disconnect them. Um, but before we move um, into that sort of area of the session of user creation. I just wanted to highlight uh, some uh, enhancements that SAP have introduced in the very recent uh, patches in relation to user management. Um, and this is to do with the identity and authentication management. So this is in place as of uh, feature pack 2208. Um, and in the most recent uh, uh, feature pack 2305, which came out a few weeks, uh, a few probably only a few days ago, there have been some further enhancements. So, this is um, what it does is uh, helps you um, manage uh, your users through a single sign on process um, and um, sort of improves the security in the system. So, um, you can you have to use the system landscape directory to manage all your user authentications. So it no longer, or at least the user setup, and you will no longer be doing it through SAP. Now, this only applies if you activate identity and authentication management. If you don't activate it, then whatever you do in terms of user management today uh, remains. But if you do activate it, then you can have um, the ability to do a unified uh, user setup across multiple databases through SLD. And it can use either the SAP Business One unified user authentication, the Microsoft uh, Windows domain account authentication. Um, you can even use Open ID Connect or IDC. Um, and with this, you can also, you know, um, activate things such as single sign-on um, and and sorry two, and multi-factor or two-factor authentication um, and in the um, you know we, we also got support for Active Directory Federation service and Azure Active Directory um, so note this is only available if you're on FB2208 or above um, but also, even if you're on that version, um, it only applies if you've activated it. Um, there is a bit of a process to setting it up, so do not just go and activate it uh, without consulting, uh, you know, your account manager or your your consultant, because uh, there is there is a bit of configuration um, to to getting it uh, up. Okay, so let's now go back into what we're going to be looking at today because even even if you do set up the users then there are a number of other things you have to do within SAP Business One so the, the identity authentication management uh, um, sort of deals with the actual creation of the user but after that um, all the other all the other processes still apply okay so let's I'll jump into uh, SAP Business One now um, and so to create a new user you have to go into administration, setup, general, and then users. So in here, um, you know, there's a number of steps you have to go through. So when you first open this up, you're in find mode. So you can go look up uh, an existing user, you know, and maintain them. Or you go into add mode, so not too different from what you do in a sales order screen or a Business Partner Master Screen. So let's go into the Add Mode and let's uh, start creating a new user. So let's say my new user is uh, um, called uh, John Blogs. Um, and so there's a checkbox here that says this is a super user. Well, if if this person can have full access to everything in the system, then you tick that. Otherwise, you wouldn't check that box. 
If the user should have mobile access, so through the apps, SAP Business One Mobility apps, then you should tick that box as well. Um, if you've got single sign-on turned on with Microsoft Windows, so then you'd be mapping that um, user, Windows user domain account um, in, in this uh, particular section. Now, um, this only applies if you've got single sign-on turned on. And um, with, uh, with the new identity authentication method, um, all that management would go into the uh, SLD anyway. Um, you can assign the user to a employee. So this is a, you know, your, your HR records. Um, and uh, so let's say I can go in and say, new employee and uh, put in the same uh, details uh, you know title let's say his uh, the operations manager um, and then you can go through and you know assign all the other details relating to the hr record you add that. Um, you can automatically add a new user. Do you want to add a new user? No, I don't want to do that. I just want to link uh, the H, uh, the employee record. I can put in a email address. So let's say John B at uh, oec dot com dot au. The mobile phone number. And a mobile device ID. Now, this mobile device ID is again relevant if you're wanting to use the SAP Mobility app. And in that case, um, you know, on the device there'll be a method of getting a device ID, and then you can insert that in here. You can, if the person has a fax number, then you can put that in. Um, the branch they belong to, the department they're working out of. Um, and then you've got this section here called groups. So this is where you can define the various um, groupings that they may belong to. So if I click on that uh, list button, I can assign them to various authorization groups. Okay, so um, which uh, you know we, which we've already predefined, um, but um, We'd, we'd be able to um, then say that this person has access to all of the inventory related um, and sales related authorizations. Okay, so what that means is that I've got it predefined and we will look at how those groups are set up. Once you have these defined and uh, authorizations assigned to those, then you know the user gets all those. Uh, you got all a few different types of groups. So you also have an alerts group. So if you've got various alerts that need to be assigned to this person, then you can use an alerts group. You've got various form settings, then you can assign um, a user to a form settings group. Um, you've got uh, UI configuration templates. Um, so this is your, you know, the actual layout of the um, documents, such as you know your sales orders and your invoices. If you've got UI configs, then you have various groups. You can assign the person to a group there, and then they can be cross ones as well. So at this stage, I'm just going to do a couple of authorization groups. So once I do that, I can see that here as well that they're assigned. I can set the password. So in here, I can go in and, and set up an initial password for this user. Um, and then I can also do whether the password never expires or I can force the user to change the password at the next login. Um, so these are the settings that you need to decide how you want to do in terms of user creation. And then here's, here's a setting that uh, allows you to lock a user. So let's say you might be setting up a new user, but the person only starts in a couple of weeks. Well, you can, you know, just set it up as lock so that you know no one else sort of logs in as that person and and, and starts processing transactions. Uh, or if someone's left the business, um, uh, then you can also lock the user at that point so that you know even though the user account is there and you cannot 
have a delete a user because uh, this history linked to it, but you can lock the account so that uh, no one else can get in under that name in case they've guessed the password. Um, so that's uh, the um, the locking mechanism. Um, one th setting that I did miss out is these defaults. So um, you can define various defaults um, in, in the system and so that when you create a user you can just assign them to a default. So I'll just assign it here. Um, but let's have a look at what, what you can do in terms of uh, uh, user Use it if uh, and um, um, yeah, let's see what you can do in terms of user defaults. So I'll go into the, one of these, um, and so you can set up, you know, things like address locations uh, for that particular default. So you know, and then you could use this in terms of when you're printing documents. You can say, well, based on this user default, we're going to show this address things like that. Um, so you've got various other things. You can define different time formats, date formats. Um, but I think the most useful thing here is um, the warehouse, for example. So, you know, this person operates out of warehouse 01. So I want to default um, for this user, the warehouse when they process a transaction should be warehouse 01. Maybe there's a cash on hand account, so petty cash account for that location. I want to set that so that when I'm processing an incoming payment cash, it defaults to that. Like same thing with checks received, same thing with um, you know your cash sale accounts. If you've got an invoice and payment account, um, you set that as well. And then this checkbox here, use warehouse address in AP documents, quite important. So when um, you've got your sh um, ship to addresses on purchasing transactions. Um, if you have this uh, checked, then it's going to use whichever warehouse is on the transaction, it's going to use that address as the ship to. So that one's quite important to, you'd almost want to check it unless, you know, you want the ship to, to be always some other default location. You've got other things like display settings. So, you know, what sort of skin you want, what sort of colors you want. I mean, if you don't set any of this, it just uses the uh, system default uh, that's already been defined. Um, print settings. So, you know, you could have scenarios where, you know, for certain types of transactions, let's say for credit memos, when uh, you add, you want to automatically print it, but you also want two copies. So, and, and it's only applicable to this particular location. Um, likewise, with the set, set uh, clearing accounts for your credit card transactions, and you can even have a different attachment folders for different uh, uh, user defaults. So you set all those up. I mean, the default is generally already predefined, but uh, you know, you'd be just then assigning that default to the user when you create them. Um, then. Over to the next tab here, which is the services tab. So here, these are just settings that uh, you can define so that when a user logs in, each time they log in, so at the beginning of each session, do you want to do you know, these particular checks? Um, so do you want to perform a data check? Do you want to open the exchange rates table, uh, which may be relevant if you're the finance person who's maintaining exchange rates? Uh, do you want to execute uh, recurring postings? Um, do you want to you know, display recurring transactions and so on? So there's quite a few different settings here. And uh, um, if any of these need to be um, you know, triggered, um, then you, then you, you know, set them up on the user. So then those those will then trigger off. Um, and then you have the same thing here with the skin colors and all, so on. So you have those on the on the user default, but on the individual users, you can also define, and then there's a bit of a hierarchy. It'll look at the users first, then it'll look at the default. And if there's nothing in the defaults, then it'll go at the system-wide default. So um, I think uh, we've got everything we need to get an initial user set up. So we'll hit the add button. Um, 
filling fields updated from the employee master. So if you want to grab those details from the employee master, you say yes, otherwise you say no. Just going to say no. And now that's created my user. Let me go find that user again. Um, and so we've already assigned the user default. That was the next thing. Um, so after that, um, if need be, and this uh, may be relevant uh, depending on how the system set up, but if in your setup um, you do have different default layouts for different uh, users so based on roles. So for example, you know, certain people, when they generate an invoice, it needs to look different from other people. Um, then you'd go and do the um, assigning of the layouts. Um, so, and you'd have to do that each one layout at a time. So, for example, um, if you've got multiple layouts for your invoices and this particular user should have a layout that's different from everyone else, then you go in, open up the transaction, hit the pencil, and then you'd go and do a set as default. So, you pick uh, whatever that layout is. So, let's say you know, the default for this particular user needs to be the second layout, not the one that's already set. Then I can go and do a set as default. And then I can, you know, select a specific user. So our user being John Bloggs. And I say, right. So for that user, I'm now setting the default. Okay, so that's how you do um, layout defaults, uh, if if relevant. I mean, you know, in, in most cases, you'd have a layout that's already intelligent enough to recognize the type of transaction, and so it kind of looks different based on what it is. But if if there's a reason for having that, then this is the step where you go through and do that. Um, the other thing you need to do is, of course, assign licenses. Um, now, one of the little enhancements that have been put in version 10 is the ability to go into the licensing screen directly from the user setup screen. So you see this, there's a checkbox. I mean, there's a button here at the bottom called licenses. You can click on that and that'll take you directly into the licensing screen and also have the user selected. Now you can, of course, go into the licenses from administration, license and license administration. This will open up the same screen. Okay, you, you can get there either way. Um, so let's, uh, let's have a look at uh, what we need to do um, on the license administration. Um, so you firstly, you got to assign the type of license. So, you know, this, as you would be aware, there's either a professional license or the user could be a limited user, or they may even be an indirect access user, um, depending on what they're doing. Um, but, you know, let's say, and you can also see how many licenses are available. So in my case, I've only got uh, the limited ones available and I'll, let's say I'll assign a limited CRM user uh, license to this particular person. Um, and then the other thing you should always do is these um, the license, these licenses types uh, which have uh, a number of 999,000. You should check all of those. So this is uh, what this does is helps uh, with the process of things like um, processing, um, you know, add-ons and, um, you know, um, workflows and things like that. So so you got to check that always. Um, and then that's that's pretty much it. So that's the assigning of the licenses. Um, you can go in and look at the assignment section to see which user has been assigned what types of licenses in case you need to do a bit of a review or an audit. So that kind of helps you uh, with the assignment of licenses. Um, and then from there, you move into the um, assignment of add-ons. So, you know, you may have various add-ons running in the system. You need to decide whether there's any special sort of assignment required there. So you go into the administration, add-ons, and add-on administration. So in here, you'll see what the default status is for different add-ons. So you can see that the payment add-on is set to manual. The 
this other UF ML on set to manual and then V1 usability as default is set to automatic, which means if I don't do anything else, that's that's the situation uh, that'll be in play. But let's say, for example, I do want to assign this user a um, um, an automatic start on the payment add-on. For example, they're, they're you know my accounts payable person, and they need to run the payment wizard, and and um, they they need to generate the file. So let's go into the user preferences. Uh, let's find John B. And so this by by default, the preferences are set to um, default. Um, so you can go in and say, actually, it needs to be automatic. So then what will happen is when the user logs in, um, the add-on will start up uh, automatically as opposed to needing to start it manually for everyone else because that's that's the overall default setting. If you do have um, add-ons in play, um, for example, B1 up, then you'd have to go in and assign licenses and, and things as such for those as well, but I'm not going to cover those because they're more specific. But uh, you know, you, if if there are add-ons, then you'd have to consider going into the license administration for each one of those and assigning the appropriate licenses. Um, so the next thing we generally do is assign the form settings. So what's form settings? Form settings is basically the grid, right? When you open up a screen, um, let's say sales order. You know what are the columns that are visible on on the grid? That's that's your form settings. Um, so how do you do that? So here's a setting here that says copy form settings. So you select that, and then you can of course you know you can say so what, what this is going to do is going to copy form settings from this current login to whichever user you've selected here, right? I mean we are of course looking for John B, so I can I can select them, um, and that would then assign. Sorry, I, because I'm already logged in as John B, I can't do that. So I, what I need to do is find a user I'm copying from. So let's say my user I'm copying from is Manager, and then I can go Copy Form Settings, and then I can select. Uh, John B and I can say copy it and then there's a few other settings so you can um, you can also select the option of copying message preferences as well as tooltip preview preferences so um, if you want to copy everything you have those checked otherwise you can untick these other two and just copy the form settings what's also nice is that now you can also specify which particular screens you want to copy form settings for. Um, so you now this has got pretty much every screen in the system and you can select, you know, for example, you just want to copy sales orders or you want to copy deliveries and so on. So you can also do that. I mean, if you don't untick everything, then, you know, when you click copy, it will just copy all the form settings um, from the user you started off with, in this case, manager to John B. Uh, so just note that when you are copying form settings, ensure that the target users are not logged in, because if they're logged in, then those settings will not apply. Um, because the way SAP works is every time a user logs in, it reads their form settings uh, from the database and it stores it in memory. And when they log off, it writes the form settings back to the database. So you know, whatever changes an individual makes during a session only gets saved back to the database um, when they log off. And if you try to copy form settings while they're logged in, well, when they log off, it will overwrite those. So if you're copying form settings, make sure that the user you're copying to is logged off. Um, and then of course, the final thing is to set the authorization. So how do we set the authorizations? Again, there's a button. Again, this is something new. You click on that, opens up the user. Um, no, I should have been on John B. And let's say authorizations. And so here it is. Now, 
there are two columns here, one that shows authorizations that have been applied to the individual user. And then there's another set column that shows, um, you know, various, or, or what, what, what they term as effective authorization. And that's coming from the groups that we had assigned. So if you recall, we had assigned a couple of authorization groups. And so those are now showing up in the effective authorization. If I, um, let's say, if you expand on the sales section, I can see here, you know, even though, for, let's say for quotes, it says no authorization as a, in our sales order, there's no authorization, but effective authorization is full. How is that possible? If I click on that, I can see that they've got read-only access as an inventory user, but full authorization as a sales group user. So that's how the groupings work. So it makes it a lot easier for you to assign people authorizations by creating roles. Um, if you don't do that, then you know, you've got to go through each of these and sort of say, okay, you have full or you don't have full, you have no access. Um, just, just take note that if you are using groups, then the effective authorization is you know, the one that permits the most. So if, if you've got full authorizations in one of the groups, then the user will have full authorization and setting no authorization here doesn't help. Um, so you need to be careful in terms of how you define the groupings. And then of course you can, um, you know, if, 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 if the groups don't give uh, people access, then you can, for example, here, you know, this is saying no authorization for, credit memo, I can still come in here and say, you know, they get full authorization individually. Um, the other thing you should consider is this max discount. This doesn't come from any of the groupings, so you need to set this um, on each user. So, you know, what is the max discount percentage this particular user can assign? You set those. Uh, the authorization groups that you've got, this is where you manage the the access levels for those groups. So you can define all of these different groups and then you can assign the authorizations uh, for them. All right, so how, how do you actually, well, that kind of concludes the actual user setup, um, but then there's a few other things we can do, including let's have a look at firstly, how do you assign um, or create groups and, um, you know, then come in here and assign the authorization. So to create a new group, you have to go into the administration, um, set up a general, and then in the user groups, you can define different types of groups, right? So you've got finance, sales, purchase, inventory. I can go in and add a row. Um, so rather create a group and then I can give it a name. Let's say um, we'll call it production. and it's an authorization group and that's how you've added um, and then you can also assign the users that are part of that group right so you can do it from here as well um, or you can uh, do it from the user setup so it's all sort of linked two ways so you can see here that it's showing john b um, and then likewise you can also create other groups uh, that are relevant um, okay so and one of the groups here is the UI configuration templates, right? So here again, you can define various groups and then assign UI configuration. Um, so let's have a look at uh, how that works. Um, so under, under administration um, and where are you? Utilities UI configuration template. This is where you can have all the different uh, templates of form layouts. So you've got, I've got one called customer service and within customer service, I've got a UI form. So I can have multiple forms. I can have a sales order, an invoice, a, a credit note and so on. Here I've got the sales order document and I have set the sales order document to have the following UI. Okay, so I've got some um, 
you know specific settings around I've, I've moved to the um, the ship to address from the logistics tab into the main screen um, and I've done some other adjustments so when you've assigned the UI template a word of caution if you if you've got b1 up and you're using item placement, do not also use UI config at the same time because they will clash. If you've got B1 up, then use the B1 up item placement. Um, don't use uh, don't use UI config. So I've I've assigned this particular one um, to my user called Alex. So when I come into um, the login Alex, and if I open up his sales order screen. There it is. I think it's 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 forced it. It's applied it, um, you know. And so that's that's the the layout that person's going to see by default. I don't have to don't have to do anything on the individual user. I've assigned the layout, and that's what they're seeing. Um, so so that's how you do that. Um, so that's kind of part of your user setup as well. Um, and then the next thing we'd be doing is assigning alerts. So, you know, if this user needs to receive certain alerts, um, you can also do that. Um, so under administration, utilities, um, alerts management. Um, and then I've got an alert that's active, one called um, customer list. If I go into that alert, and again, I've got the ability to assign the alert to the individual. Or if I've got groups, then I can assign it to a group. So if, for instance, when I set up the user John, and John was already part of this group called CS Alerts, then I wouldn't have to come in here and, and reassign it to him individually, because um, you know, based on the grouping creation, they already have the alerts assigned. So, so that's how you, um, you know, but, but, but if they're not part of a group and you want to individually assign it to them, you can of course do that. You just need to find the person. Here you go, Joe Blog, John Blogs, internal alert, as well as an email, and that's that's done. Um, the next thing you'd have to do is if you are having approval processes in your system, so you know when a you know let's say it could be purchasing approvals or it could be um, sales related approvals, then you need to assign the user to that approval process. So how do you do that? Um, so under administration, approval process, and approval stage, um, sorry, and approval templates. In here, you need to go in and find the relevant approval stages. So for example, here's one that's saying any purchase <laughs> orders greater than $250, I want to take it through an approval process. I'll assign my user John Blogs to that. I mean, this is already a defined, predefined approval. I'm just adding the user. You can then see what documents um, are relevant uh, to this process. Now, instead of the person being an originator, they need to be added to an approval, they need to become an approver, then you need to go and look at the approval stages, right? So so let's say this purchase order over 250, uh, the approval stage um, right now has Jason Butler, but I could then go in and add, um, you know, John Blogs to it as well. So this depends on you know whether they become, they're a, a requester or an approver. You go in and um, assign them to the relevant place. And and there's some settings here around number of approvals required and number of rejections required. Um, so if you've got multiple approvers, then you can define whether one approval is sufficient for the transaction to move forward. Um, and likewise, is, is one rejection uh, sufficient for the transaction to be rejected? Um, and then the, this tab here, the terms, is, is where you define the rules, right? So, you know, and this is more a setup part. You wouldn't be doing this on a user setup, but upfront, you'd be setting up this template. In this case, the template saying, you know, if the total document value is greater than 250, it needs to go for approval. 
Um, there can be other types of approvals um, that aren't directly related to these um, standard rules that are here. So the standard rules here are that it always applies, so it applies based on document totals, discount percentages, GP margins, deviation from credit limits. But what you can also do is have rules that apply based on some sort of logic. So in this case, I've got an approval where discount is greater than 5%, and I've got a query that I'm running, uh, or a query that, that sort of works out whether this particular transaction that's being processed should uh, go through an approval flow. Um, and so some of this is more sort of advanced configuration, but if, as far as a new user setup is concerned, if, if all these definitions exist, then all you need to do is um, put the user into the either the originator, or if they're gonna be an approver, then find the approval stage and put them in as an approver. That's, that's pretty much what you need to do from a, from a user setup uh, perspective. Um, all right, um, so let's uh, move on to the um, viewing of the user login history. So what we can do is um, if we go into tools and um, access log, in here you'll be able to see all the users in the system and their, their history. So for example, here my user Alex. Um, Alex uh, last logged in today at 8.25. Um, and so and the last time they logged off was yesterday at 7 p.m. So they've kind of currently logged in, right? And then and, and it's saying last access status succeeded. Um, but what's also interesting is if I double click on the line, then I can see a history of when they've logged in and logged off. Okay, so you know they've logged in on the 27th, they've logged in on the 26th, um, and the 21st. So you can see clearly when, when they've logged on, which PC they logged in from, uh, what Windows account they were logging in. Uh, it gives you a clear, clear view of, uh, of the full history. Um, so that's the access log. Um, and then the final point we had here was uh, how to view who's currently logged in and how to disconnect that person um, in case you know you need to do some further processing or you need to make run some maintenance. So under administration utilities um, connected clients, you can see here. Now this will not show if you're your login, right? So I'm in this session, I'm logged in as user Jason Butler. It doesn't show me because you know you can't you can't sort of disconnect yourself. You just log off if, if that's the requirement. So we can see here user Alex is currently logged in. Um, and I can see that here. That's my session for Alex. Now I can send them a message. So I can say to Alex, uh, please log off uh, in five minutes. Need to perform server reboot. Or whatever that message may be. So we, we put that in. Um, and then there it is. We've got the message pop up on the uh, on Alex's um, session. So you know, Alex may ignore my message and continue working. Um, and five minutes later, I come and check. I can refresh the screen. I can see that Alex is still logged in, hasn't paid attention. I can highlight the user and disconnect him. And so you're about to disconnect the user. Do you want to continue? Yes. So eventually the user may be doing something and then all of a sudden the session is gone. You know, so it, it, it kicks them off the system 
um, if if they if they don't log if, log off themselves. 